Unsolved Mysteries. Out of deference to people who may still be living, character names in some of these unsolved mysteries have been changed. The fact that a man may be arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced for the crime of murder does not always, at least to everyone's satisfaction, mean the solution of a murder mystery. Particularly so is this the case in the trial of Oscar Slater. And to those lovers of the great character Sherlock Holmes, it must be of interest to know that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle spent 17 years of his life trying to prove that Oscar Slater did not commit murder. A murder that to this day is one of Scotland Yard's unsolved mysteries. scene is Glasgow, Scotland, the night of December 21st. Thick, soot-laden fog swirls along the dimly lighted streets. A fog so thick that it deadens even that roar of traffic which rises perpetually from Glasgow's teeming thoroughfares. Outside 15 Queen's Terrace, a street lamp throws a grayish-yellow circle on the damp pavement. But inside number 15 Queen's Terrace, an apartment house. What the deuce is that? Sounds as if it came from Miss Gilchrist. But Miss Gilchrist could hardly be making that noise. The servant Lambie could. I'm going up there. I don't like it. Oh, good evening, Mr. Adams. Good evening, Lambie. You weren't by any chance chopping wood or something upstairs. Oh, no, Mr. Adams. I've been down to the corner for the evening piper. Uh, who's up there? Come out of Miss Gilchrist's apartment. Oh, I don't know. I never saw him before. Let's go up there. I don't like the look of things. Oh, the door's open, and I left it closed. I don't see Miss Gilchrist in the living room. Oh. What is it? Oh, what is it? Look behind the dining table. Oh. Is, is she dead? Yes. That man. The man we saw leave the room. Stop him. Stop him. Please, murder. Stop that man. But the man had gone. All trace of him swallowed up in the rolling bank of fog. Fifteen minutes later, the police, the examining doctor for the Crown, and the detective inspector are on the scene of the crime. Now, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Have the boys check up every boarding house, hotel, everything, and find out every single person who has checked out in the past hour and from now on. Yes, sir. Anything else, sir? Check steamship passengers. Of course, sir. Pawnbrokers. Uh, keep a lookout for pieces of jewelry, such as you see in that photograph on the piano. That photograph of Miss Gilchrist. At once, sir. Uh, finished, Doctor? Yes, Inspector. How did the murderer get in here? Both doors can only have been opened from the inside. Let the newspapers work that out. I'm a police inspector. All I want is the murderer. Twenty-four hours later in the Glasgow Police Headquarters, the detective inspector sits behind a table going through the mass of information unearthed by his department. A sergeant of police bursts excitedly into the room, a piece of brown wrapping paper in one hand, a ship's sailing and passenger list in the other. Inspector, look here. What is it, sergeant? Found this wrapping paper in a flat vacated late last night. Yes, what is it? It's from a jeweler, evidently used to wrap a watch or something about that size. Name on the label, Oscar Slater. Yes, go on. Slight build, nervous, foreign-looking. Fits a description of the murderer given by Lambie. Then this, the shipping list of the Empress of Calcutta. Third-class passage book next day. The day following the murder. Two persons, Otto Sando and wife. Oscar Slater. Otto Sando. Good work, Sergeant. I'll cable the United States and have the New York police hold Mr. Otto Sando for identification. The New York police arrested Otto Sando, who turned out to be Oscar Slater. A month later, the prisoner was shipped back to Scotland. And in May, in the High Court of Scotland, Oscar Slater was tried before my Lord Guthrie. The witness Lammy to the stand, please. 
You've been duly sworn? Yes, my lord. On the night of the murder, you saw the murderer leave Miss Gilchrist's room. May please, your lordship, I protest. The witness is not competent to judge whether or not the person seen leaving the murdered woman's room is or was the murderer. I'll put the question in this manner. You would recognize the person you saw leaving Miss Gilchrist's room? Yes, my lord. Is he in the court? He is, my lord. He is the prisoner. Oh. That is all. Learned counsel for the defense may question the witness on behalf of the prisoner. Thank you, my lord. Lamby, I wish you to be very careful in your answers. You say that the prisoner at bar is the man you saw leaving Miss Gilchrist's flat? Yes, my lord. How do you recognize him? By his features. Nothing else? I don't understand. In New York, you identified the prisoner by his peculiar walk. I'm reading from your deposition taken at that time. I recognize the prisoner by the peculiar walk. I did not see his features. I did not see his features clearly. And your identification today is more clear than of one month ago? That is all. You may stand down. Mr. Adams to the stand. You understand that the oath taken yesterday is still binding upon you? Yes, my lord. You saw the man the Crown contends was the murderer leaving Miss Gilchrist's flat? Yes, my lord. Is he in court? Yes, my lord. He is the prisoner. That is all. Your witness, counsel for the defense. Adams, learned counsel for the Crown has asked you definitely if the prisoner at bar is the man you saw leaving Miss Gilchrist. Do you swear positively and absolutely that he is the man? I am a little nearsighted, my lord. I should not care to swear at this distance. Go to the prisoner. Look him in the face. He is on trial for his life. Much depends upon your answer. Will you swear that that is the man? My lord, to the best of my belief, this is the man. Oh. Defense thanks the witness for his fair-mindedness. He may stand down. May it please the court, the Crown rests its case upon the evidence presented. Then learned counsel for the Crown may address the jury. I thank his lordship. You have heard these witnesses swear that the prisoner, Oscar Slater, is the man seen leaving Miss Gilchrist's flat. I come next to the prisoner's guilty flight, for guilty it was. An honest man does not engage passage on a vessel in an assumed name, not after the hue and cry has been raised about a brutal murder. It is always a painful duty to plead with a jury to condemn a man to death, but in this case I say to you, with every fiber of my being, that... As counsel for the defense... I say that the Crown has not even attempted to show how the prisoner attained entrance to Miss Gilchrist's flat. The door to the apartment house was locked with a spring lock. The prisoner had not any means of obtaining a key. Not only that, but the prisoner, supposing that he had obtained entrance to the apartment house, had no means of entering Miss Gilchrist's flat, unless she herself admitted him. And, gentlemen of the jury, Miss Gilchrist was found lying before the hearth in the dining room. She would have screamed long ere that had she been afraid. And I say to you, gentlemen of the jury, that that one fact alone clears the prisoner. Because the murderer, gentlemen, was someone known to Miss Gilchrist, since she never would have admitted the murderer without protest. Gentlemen, I have finished. The life of a man, a human being, is in your hands. The jury may retire to consider their verdict. <laughs> On such evidence, then, did the jury retire to consider a verdict. Both the police and the prosecution completely ignored the difficulty of the murderer's access to the murdered woman's apartment. But the jury was absent just one hour and ten minutes. And now they are again in the jury box. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, my lord. We find the prisoner as charged. Guilty. My, my lord, may I say one word? Will you allow me to speak? I think learned counsel for the defense should instruct his client. But if he insists, I shall allow him to talk. My lord, what shall I say? My father and mother are poor people. I come of my own free will from America. I come to defend my right. I know nothing about it. I come from America. I know nothing about this murder. Prisoner at the bar, you have been found guilty of murder. You will be taken from this courtroom to the place whence you came. And thence to a place of lawful execution where you will be hanged by the neck till you be dead, dead, dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. But Oscar Slater did not hang. People who saw in the case a mystery not to be solved by the mere bringing in of a verdict of guilty appealed to the Home Secretary and the prisoner's sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. Oscar Slater served 17 years in prison. Today he is free, absolved of the crime, and the British government, in recognition of the miscarriage of justice, awarded him a considerable sum of money. In just a moment, you will hear a solution to the trial of Oscar Slater.
Ladies and gentlemen, inasmuch as any solution must of necessity be supposition, liberties of time, place, and characters have been taken in this solution for which you have been waiting. We return you to the High Court of Scotland, where my Lord Guthrie, presiding at the trial of Oscar Slater, sums up the evidence before the jury. In his lordship's summing up lies the solution as to how the murderer gained access to Miss Gilchrist's home. Order in the court. Learned counsel for the defense has no other motion to make before the bench addresses the jury. No, my lord. Counsel for the crown has no additional evidence. No, my lord. As presiding judge in this case, I do not feel that it is necessary to dwell upon the seriousness of the crime or the importance of your verdict. The learned counsel for the defense has made an issue of the fact that Oscar Slater could not gain access to the murdered woman's home. But, gentlemen, I would be delinquent in my duty if I did not point out to you that that was not the impossibility, it seems. In the first place, it must be borne in mind that it was not a key which was required to gain admittance to Miss Gilchrist's house. That is, to open the front door. There was a speaking tube arrangement whereby the caller could speak to the inhabitant of any particular apartment. The occupant of the apartment, satisfied that he or she wished to see the caller, would then pull a release which opened the catch on the front door. This was the defense point when they maintained that the murderer must have been known to Miss Gilchrist in order to have gained admittance. A study of human frailties, though, will show that this does not necessarily apply. Undoubtedly, Lambie the maid, going as she did each night for an evening paper, would upon occasion forget her latchkey. What then would she do? She would ring the bell. Tell Miss Gilchrist through the speaking tube arrangement that she had forgotten her key, and Miss Gilchrist would then release the door catch. After this had occurred many times, as it must have over a period of years, Miss Gilchrist would, if the bell were rung immediately after Lambie's departure, release the door catch without question. This, then, was what the murderer was waiting for. The murderer undoubtedly had watched the inhabitants for a period of time, and one night, the night of the murder, Lambie the maid left to get the evening paper. The murderer stepped quickly to the door and rang the bell. Miss Gilchrist, thinking that once again Lambie had forgotten her key, would release the catch, leave the apartment door open. The murderer would enter, and in a few moments everything would be over. And so a judge on the bench solved the real mystery as to how Miss Gilchrist was murdered. But to this day, no one knows who the actual murderer was. And to the Glasgow police, the famous Oscar Slater case is still an unsolved mystery.